But we want to look at some more interesting examples. So what that means is we want to find some examples of non-abelian groups, subgroups, well, subgroups that are super rigid in non-abelian groups. And the way we do that is by looking at what's special about ZK in RK. And the answer to a group theorist is that everybody knows, every group theorist knows that ZK is a lattice in RK. And for today, whenever I say lattice, all my lattices are going to be what's called co-compact. In general, we'll want to look at more uh, lattices that aren't co-compact. But for today, I'm just going to give the definition of a co-compact lattice and pretend that that's what all lattices are like. Right, so the thing to note what that means, ZK is a lattice in RK, means just a few obvious things. First of all, RK is a top it's a group, but also it's a topological space. And as a topological space, excuse me, it's simply connected, in fact it's simply connected. So it's a group, I mean, we're talking in group theory, but as a topological space, it's simply connected. Well, that's what a Lie group is. A Lie group, well, maybe I should say more generally, a topological group is a topological space that's a group. But I want, when I've got a simply connected manifold, I'll call that a Lie group for today's purposes. It's a bunch of, yeah, it's, it's a connected group. And then inside that Lie group, we've got this subgroup, ZK. And the first crucial thing about ZK is that it's discrete. It obviously has no accumulation points. The integer points do not accumulate anywhere. It's, it's a discrete subgroup of RK. And then the last thing, the lattice property, so there's lots of discrete subgroups of groups. The key thing, the lattice property, is that every element of RK is just a bounded distance of some element of the subgroup. So there's some number C, and in fact, I guess maybe 2 to the K must be plenty big enough. There's some number, though, so that every element of RK is within that distance of some element of ZK. That's what a lattice is, at least a co-compact lattice. So that means it's, I mean, the lattice is a discrete subgroup, so it obviously can't be the whole group, but it's filling up the whole space. It goes everywhere. There's no part of the space that it's missing. It comes within a bounded distance of every point. That's what a lattice is. Okay. And that's, that's the crucial thing to get a super rigid subgroup. So, in general, the definition of a lattice is this. So this, was, this is what it means to say that ZK is a lattice in RK. If you've got some subgroup H of a group G, and you can replace ZK with H everywhere, so, with, sorry, so you've got a subgroup gamma of a group G, and you can replace RK with G everywhere. So like if gamma, well, if G is a simply connected group, and gamma is a discrete subgroup, and every element of G is within the bounded distance of gamma, in that case, we say that gamma is a lattice. In fact, a co-compact lattice in G. That's the definition of lattice. It's a discrete subgroup that fills up the whole group. That's what a lattice is in G. And, well, before I talk about lattices, let me just say something about the Lie groups. It's a fact that Lie groups come in three types. There's three basic types of Lie groups. First of all, there's the easy ones. The solvable groups are the ones that have lots and lots of normal subgroups. And the basic example is an abelian group. In an abelian group, every subgroup is normal. So there's lots of normal subgroups. That's what a solvable group is. The opposite end are simple groups. Simple groups have basically no normal subgroups. I'm putting that in quotes because that's not quite right. There could be some finite collection of normal subgroups, but they're almost, practically there's no normal subgroups, and an example of that is SLK of R. So it's a fact that SL, the only normal subgroups of SLKR are just tiny finite groups. In fact, if K is odd, there are no normal subgroups at all of SLKR. Uh, well, that's, yeah, that's right, that's okay. okay. And then the only other possibility is, well, Lie group, a connected Lie group is either solvable or simple or some combination of the two. And actually, instead of simple, I guess I should say something called semi-simple. Let's just say solvable and simple. And so, for example, um, your group, instead of just being RK or SLKR, could be the product of RK with SLKR. And more or less, if your group is a combination, if G is a combination of an abelian of a solvable group with a simple group, then in fact gamma will also be a combination of a lattice in the solvable group across a lattice in the simple group. Okay, so if you've got a general Lie group, 
it'll split up and there'll be a soluble part and a simple or semi-simple part and any lattice, this is, it's not quite this simple, but basically the lattice will also break up into two parts. Every lattice in a combination group will have a soluble part and a semi-simple part. And what that means is if you're trying to understand lattices and Lie groups, there's two basic things to do. Study the soluble ones and then study the simple ones and then actually once that's done, usually it's easy to put those two theories together. If you understand the soluble groups and the simple groups, usually it's not difficult to understand a general group just by combining a theorems for the two separate cases. So we should look at either, if we want to not study everything, we should look at soluble groups or simple groups or combination. And the truth is that the simple case is usually the most interesting, most difficult part of understanding the theory. If you have some question you're studying about Lie groups, usually the soluble groups, I mean abelian groups are trivial, usually that's very easy. Simple case is hard, and once you study the two parts, it's easy to put them together. That's what usually happens. And it's pretty much the same thing here in the case of studying lattices and super rigidity, but in order to avoid complications, we're just going to do the easy case. Let's look at soluble groups. Okay, so let's look at super rigid subgroups of soluble groups. Because, well, that's easy. Simple would be pretty hard. Once we do those two, the rest would be pretty easy. So let's just, as an example, to understand something about super rigidity, get some ideas, let's look at super rigid subgroups of soluble groups. Oh, but before we do that, let me give you the definition of a soluble group. Okay. A connected, and this definition probably isn't one, the one you learned in, in graduate school, but it works. If you've got a connected Lie group of matrices, if you've got a group of matrices, then it's easy to see if it's solvable. It's solvable if and only if it's upper triangular. Okay, so all that means is that to be solvable means that G is contained in the group of upper triangular matrices. That's it. Okay, that's probably not the definition you learned, but it's, it's true. Well, actually, that's not quite right because either it's a bunch of upper triangular matrices or it'll be upper triangular after you change the basis. So it can conjugate it to be upper triangular. And that's actually equivalent to, I mean, usually you learn that a group is solvable if there's this chain of subgroups, there's abelian quotients and stuff like that. But it's not hard to see that any group of upper triangular matrices, there's sort of some obvious chains to put in and get abelian groups, and the converse is true as well. So let, let's take this is our definition of a solvable group because it actually is right, it's easier to check than looking for those chains of subgroups. Okay. And so for example, well in graduate school you probably learned that abelian groups are solvable. That's the basic fact. That's the starting point for the usual definition of solvable groups. And let's just check to make sure that my definition has the same property. And the point is just that We've learned, even as an undergraduate, that every matrix can be made into upper triangular form uh, over C. A single matrix could always be made to be upper triangular if all of your eigenvalues are in the field. And so, if you take it, if, so this is true not just for C, but for any algebraically closed field. Or any algebraically closed field, every matrix can be put in upper triangular form. And then it's not as obvious, but it's a fact that if you have a bunch of pairwise commuting matrices, if you have a bunch of matrices that all commute with each other, then in fact you can make them all triangular with the same basis. And that's exactly what we need to do. If you've got a abelian group and all the matrices commute with each other, make them all upper triangular at the same time, then you've got your group as upper triangular. Okay, so this is not difficult. And this is basically why the definition I gave is equivalent to the definition that you usually learn for a sophomore group. All right, so now that we know what a solvable group is, it's easy, I mean, so I'll give you, I'll write, make some, write down some examples of groups that are obviously upper triangular, so I don't have to check they're solvable, they're obviously solvable. All right, let's give some examples of lattices, and then I'll tell you whether or not the lattice is super rigid. Okay, so here's an example of an upper triangular group. So it's, let's just take real entries instead of complex and put ones on the diagonal there, but that's my group. And now the question is how to make a lattice, and well, the lattice we had before in RK, we just took the integer points of RK was a lattice in RK. So we had this group, RK, take all the integer points, then look at the lattice. Well, that's the way I always make lattices. Here's a group. The lattice in gamma will just be the integer points of this group. What that means is instead of all these R's, I'll just replace them all by Z's. And it's not difficult to see that every element of G is within some bounded distance of elements of of gamma, because yeah, you're like distance one there, one there, one there, so it's going to be within distance six or something like that, right? I mean, every coordinate you only have to change by one instead of some total bounded distance from every element of G to some element of gamma. 
Okay, and let me just make an observation. There's a risky closure of gamma. I didn't define this risky closure, but there's a, in practice, the way to think about it is just that this risky closure of a group is definitely going to be some group, and it's also going to be connected. Actually, technically, it might find it in any compost. Let's just say connected. So the way to think about this risky closure for today's purposes, anyhow, is just that this risky closure of gamma is the obvious connected group that contains gamma. The obvious connected group that contains gamma. And here, here's gamma. Well, the obvious connected group that contains gamma is to change to be connected. You don't you got you put any any integer there. If you connect up all the integers, you get all real numbers. And you have to have all real numbers there. The obvious connected group that contains gamma is the same thing, but with R's instead of Z's. It's just Z. I hope that makes sense. Just the obvious connected group containing gamma is G. So this risky closure of gamma is G. And then something that's not at all obvious, but it's not, you know, it's, if you know about the theory of what are called Milpolton groups, it's not hard to prove that it's not obvious, but in fact, this is super rigid. If you have a homomorphism defined on these integer points, you can extend it to be defined in all of G. Right, so that's the first example. Here's another example. So this was an example of upper triangular with ones on the diagonal. The other thing is, so I made the diagonal as simple as possible and did whatever I want there. The opposite is to make all of this zero and just keep stuff on the diagonal. So let's take the group of diagonal matrices. And if that's G, then my lattice, I always do the same thing. I take the integer points. But integer points, uh, it may not be obvious what I mean by integer points here. The thing is that this is a multiplicative group. And multiplicative integer points, I mean, well, you have to take exponentials what it comes down to. You're not allowed to do zero there. So this is, I mean, yeah, these matrix, to get positive numbers like this multiplicatively, you have to take exponentials. So I'm looking at all the integer powers of something. That would be my integer points. Okay. And again, What's the obvious connected group that contains all of these integer matrices? Well, I think it's all diagonal matrices. It's G. And now a question we could ask, super rigid or not? And the thing is, at this point, actually, if you've been paying attention, it's supposed to be obvious that gamma is super rigid in G. And the reason is that I already did this example. This group G is isomorphic to just R3. Just take logarithms to get it. This G is isomorphic to R3, and inside R3, I just take the integer points. This is Z3 inside R3 of isomorphism, and ZK is always super rigid in RK. So this is an example we've already done before. It's just written in a more complicated way. So I wrote. Oh, the metric? Yeah, so. Uh, the question is, what's the metric on this group? Because I talked about things like being within a bounded distance. Does that what you mean? Yeah, so I guess the easiest way to get the metric is this group is isomorphic to R3. Take the metric at R3. That's the, group, that's the metric I want. Because in general, I want a, a metric that's invariant under translation. So and the, way, the easiest way to get it is take the metric of G. But the other way, actually, I should have said this too. Instead of talking about distances, another way to say it is that to say that gamma is the lattice in G, means that if you take gamma times some compact set, you get all of G. Then I don't have to worry about what the metric is. Is that OK? So if you just take all the matrices that are between 1 and 4 here, sorry, one in, an entry between 1 and 2 here, 1 and 2 here, 1 and 2 here, that's a compact set. And if you multiply gamma times that compact set, you get all of G. So that's another way to say it. But to talk elementary terms, I talked about distance. Yeah. So, yeah, the distance between. So, the distance between two matrices here. I guess what you do is you take the ratio of the two entries, the ratio of two entries, ratio of the two entries. Take the log, square it, add it up, take the square root. But the easier way. I mean, all I've done is I just turn this into R three. But in general, yeah, in any Lie group, you can certainly put a metric on there that's invariant under all translations, and that's what I'm doing. It, yeah, actually, it might not be unique, but for a simple group like this, yeah, it, it doesn't matter. They're all to equal within some up to a constant multiple of each other. Okay. But, so let's look at something more interesting. So here's where, I mean, those last two examples are just a warm up. Here's where I really need to do something. So let's let G be something a little more sophisticated. I've only been using real entries now before, but now you can put any real number you want there and any complex number you want there. And then gamma is going to be the integer points of G. Well, it's obvious what I mean by integer points of R. Integer points of C, though, it's a little more complicated. I mean, maybe the easiest way to think about it is really C is like R plus R. 
And inside R plus R, I should get a Z2. Well, how do I get a Z2? That's because I don't want to just take the ordinary integers Z. I need to take algebraic integers, like Gaussian integers. So I'll take Z plus ZI. Okay? That's the integer points of C. Okay? And then, it's easy to see, I mean, if you didn't follow, it's certainly clear that gamma, well, you can check the gamma's a lattice in G, and the Zariski closure of G, the Zariski closure, oh, I should say, yeah, the Zariski closure of G is certainly G itself. I mean, G is the obvious connected group that contains G. But gamma, the Zariski closure, well, the way, another way to think about it is, suppose ga, this is gamma, and gamma knows it is that the universe is connected. I mean, this is gamma. And it's discrete, but it knows it lives in a connected universe. Well, what would it think the universe is? Well, it knows there's all integers here, so it must realize that there's got to be real numbers allowed there. And if you've got all of these things here and it knows the space is connected, it must realize you can put complex numbers there. So this risky closure will be real numbers here, complex numbers there. That's exactly G. This risky closure of gamma is G. And now, again, it's supposed to be obvious whether or not this is super rigid. And the answer is that it is super rigid, and it's for the same reason as last time. These matrices, it might not be obvious, but whenever you have matrices all on the top row like this, with one at the start, these all commute with each other. And it's three dimensional. This is just another copy of R3. I wrote it in a funny way, but this is R3, and this is Z3 inside of R3. It's super rigid. All right, so now, so I've just did, I've done that same example a silly way, but now let me do something that's different. G prime is a little bit different from G. It's similar to what we have here, because I'm, again, I'm going to have real numbers there and complex numbers there, but the crucial thing is I'm also going to have some stuff down here. And there's a correlation. You can put any real number you want right there, but whatever number you put there will determine the complex number that goes here. So I hope it's clear. You can put any complex number there, any real number, but you put what you put there determines what you can put down in the bottom corner. Here. That's my group G. So you have to check, but it is true that uh, this set of matrices is closed under multiplication, so it is a group. Okay, but yeah, it's not hard to check that. And now here's where something actually interesting happens. And it's not obvious what I said before. I want to look at this risky closure of G prime. That means I want the obvious connected group that contains G prime. So I want the obvious connected group that contains G prime. Well, the naive answer is, well, of course, G prime is connected, so it's the obvious connected group that contains G. But the thing is that the risky closure is an idea from the theory of algebraic geometry, and in algebraic geometry, the only functions that are allowed are polynomials. Like, a topologist doesn't believe in a function if it's not continuous. Just, I mean, a function that's not continuous just simply doesn't exist. Whereas an analyst would look at some terrible measurable function and say that's a function. But in topology, you only look at functions that are continuous. Similarly, in algebraic geometry, you only look at functions that are polynomials. And this e to the 2 pi i t, that function is transcendental. It's not a polynomial. So as far as an algebraic geometer is concerned, as far as somebody who doesn't understand anything but polynomials, there is no connection between t and e to the 2 pi i t. If you have t, an algebraic geometer cannot calculate e to the 2 pi i t. This just looks like some random number. So to an algebraic geometer, there's no connection between t and e to the 2 pi i t. They look like two completely independent numbers. And so what that means is when you take this risky closure, you lose the connection between these two entries. They become independent. So that means when you look at this risky closure, you can put any real number you want there, and the number you put here is independent of what you put there. So we're going to get any real number there, and in the bottom corner there, independent of what you put there, you put any number here, except you notice all these numbers on the unit circle. Right? So the thing is that in this risky closure, these two become decoupled. They become independent, so we get a Cartesian product. And the way to think about it is, since we're all topologists and geometers here, I think it's like if the map from T to, if this map here were just some terrible measurable function, the closure of the graph would be the full product. I mean, the graph would be dense in, uh, in the Cartesian product. And that's what we're getting here. Okay, so there's risky closure of G prime with something weird. It's not just G prime itself. And now, gamma prime, I need to get a lattice in G prime. And but now I hope you all know how I'm going to get a lattice. I'm just going to take the integer points in G prime. And what do you get if you take the integer points here? Well, that means you can put any integer you want there, and whatever integer you put there will be determine the, the number you put here. But if t is an integer, either the 2 pi i t is going to be just 1. So my lattice just has 
any integer you want up there, it's got ones here, and then of course then you can take the integer points to see up there. And we've seen this lattice before, gamma prime is exactly the same as gamma. Okay, so we're seeing, I mean, what that means is that gamma, here's gamma, is a lattice in G prime, but we already saw that gamma is a lattice in G. Gamma is actually a lattice in these two different groups. It's a lattice in G and it's a lattice in G prime. And now is where we get to the problem or the issue here. There's a risky closure of gamma. Gamma is a lattice in G prime, but there's risky closure of gamma we already decided with G. G is the obvious connected group that contains gamma. That is not G prime. G and G prime are two different things. This risky closure of G prime is something completely different than this risky closure of G. So it turns out that because of this, this risky closure of gamma is certainly not the same as risky closure of G prime. And because of that, gamma is not going to be super rigid in G prime. It's a super rigid subgroup of G because gamma knows about G. I mean, gamma, gamma thinks G is the world. Gamma thinks that G is the universe. Gamma does not know anything about it. What we did was we took this group that G was, that Gamma was happy to be in. Gamma is a super rigid subgroup of G. It's exactly where it wants to live. And then without telling Gamma, we changed the group. We added some rotations to the universe without telling Gamma. Gamma has no way of knowing that there's rotations down here. So what that means is that if you have a homomorphism that's defined on Gamma, it has no idea that when it extends, it's supposed to take care of these rotations that are involved. So there's, it has no hope of being super rigid because, I mean, the home warps of gamma, they, they just don't know that they're supposed to be compatible with something else that's not there. It doesn't know about it. That's the idea. But in fact, we can prove it. If you didn't understand what I was saying there, that's okay. The point is, it's obvious that gamma is not super rigid in G prime because we just take, say, the identity map from gamma to gamma. That's a homomorphism from gamma into a group of matrices that simply obviously does not extend to a homomorphism defined on G prime that maps to this risky closure of gamma. Remember, that's the final condition is that there's, there, maybe there's an extension, but you're not going to be able to get an extension that goes to this risky closure because that's the risky closure. We decided already it's G. And G, I mentioned already, that's R3, it's abelian. But G prime, you can check, maybe it's not obvious, but it's true, you can check, it's easy to see that there's matrices in G prime that do not commute with each other. And there's no way to map a non-abelian group inside an abelian group. It's just not going to happen. Okay? So there's no extension. This map is definitely not going to extend. And again, the reason it happened is that we changed the group G without changing gamma. We added something to G that gamma doesn't know about. And in fact, the reason I wanted to do this example is that's the only way that you're going to get an example of a gamma that's not super rigid. The only time it's going to happen that gamma is not super rigid is that gamma is inside of some group G and it's happy to be there. It's super rigid, but then you change G by adding some, well, I'll just call these rotations, elements of the unit circle there are rotations. You start with the G that gamma is happy in, you add some extra rotations to G without telling gamma, well, there's no way it's going to be able to be super rigid. And that's exactly, that's the only way that it happens. So let me write this down. So the proposition, and is that if gamma is super rigid in G, then gamma has to know about all of G. This risky closure of gamma has to contain all of G. So G has to be the obvious connected group that contains gamma. If it's got stuff in it that gamma didn't know about, then it's not going to be super rigid. And actually, I mean, that, that seems obvious, but it's not quite true. There's some fine print, you can ignore this. But the point is just that any group G can be represented as matrices in lots of different ways. And there's a risky closure depends on exactly which matrices you pick to represent your group gamma. So this mod Z, Z of G business just means that we should use the adjoint representation, which is the obvious representation of G. But let's not worry about fine print like that today. Okay? And let's just give the proof here is that we certainly have a map. Let me just take the inclusion of gamma into I mean, if gamma is already a group of matrices, this, just look at this like the identity map. Gamma just is sitting inside of, uh, gamma is a group of matrices. That map must extend to a homomorphism of G. If gamma is super rigid, then any map into matrices has to extend to be defined on all of G. With the image of that map, G, being contained in this risky closure of gamma. And that's it. So that means that 
G is contained in this risky closure of gamma, and it's obvious since gamma is a subgroup of G, the risky closure of gamma is contained in the subgroup of G. Okay, so this, this proof is actually obvious. And then it's not so obvious though, so it seems, I hope it's pretty clear, that if it's too rigid, then G can't have things that gamma doesn't have. What's not so obvious but is true is that, in fact, a lattice and a soluble group G will be super rigid. That certainly implies that there's risky closure are equal. Well, in fact, it's if and only if there's a risky closure are equal. So this is actually a theorem. I don't think it's obvious. And it's one of these things, at least I hope it's not obvious, because that actually is my theorem. That's the theorem I proved. So if it's trivial, you should probably tell me. But I hope you won't be able to come up with an obvious proof. And again, actually, there's this fine pit here, modulo 7G. Okay, that's the basic theorem. And then the only other thing I want to say, I mentioned this before, is that also, the only way this condition down here can fail about the risky closures is that some of the rotations associated to G prime do not come from rotations of the gamma. So then rotations are basically, uh, I mean, whenever we're talking about a solvable group, we've got upper triangular matrices, and essentially the rotation part of, a matri of an upper triangular matrix is just you take the things on the unit circle that you get from the diagonal entries. So if this risky closure of G is not the same as the risky closure of gamma, then what happened is you did exactly like I did in that example before, that we had this risky closure of gamma and then just added in some things on the, on the diagonal. Okay, that's the only way to make, us, make something not super rigid. Yeah. Okay, so that's the, that's the basic theory of super rigidity for solvable groups. It's easy to tell whether or not a lattice is uh, super rigid. It's just you have to check that it's a risky dense in G. But let me now talk about some, in, some, more, uh, some groups that are not solvable. So uh, if you have a lattice in any group G, it's I mean, a group that's neither, sol not neither solvable nor simple. It's a combination of a solvable group and a, and a simple group. Well, it turns out that, remember, G has a solvable part and a simple part. The solvable part, we know when it's super rigid. And so what's left is the simple part. It turns out the combination is I mean, it's just the obvious thing. So if gamma is going to be super rigid, I think it's clear that this risky closure has to be right, except there's some fine prints here about rotations and centers and stuff. I'm not worried about that. But essentially, we can tell exactly when a lattice is super rigid. First of all, the risky closure has to be right, and then secondly, the simple part of gamma has to be super rigid in the simple part of G. And the trouble is, this is not obvious. Simple groups are hard to deal with. It's still not known which lattices are super rigid in simple groups. And that's where that we, I did the solvable case. The, the big shots in group theory are studying the, the, the simple case. And unfortunately, it's not done, but most of them are done. There's a famous theorem called the Margulis super rigid theorem that tells us, for example, every lattice in SLNR is super rigid. Every lattice in SLNR is super rigid, except in SL2R, they're not. Okay, so every lattice in SLNR is super rigid. And in fact, this theorem is not just for SLNR, it works for most simple groups. Take any simple Lie group, except there's a condition, like here we needed N at least three, we need this to be a large group. There's a general case, you need to assume that something called the real rank is at least two. And so that any simple group that's large, all of its lattices are going to be uh, super rigid. The trouble is we don't know what happens in the rank one case. Some of them are, some of them aren't, and some of them we don't know. That's the trouble. But if people, if the experts could finish up just the simple groups, then we know for every Lie group which lattice is super rigid. And let me go talk about a very important consequence of super rigidity. This is maybe the most important thing I'll, I'll say today. The cycle, I hope people understand the basic idea of super rigidity. It just says that homomorphisms are defined on the lattice and have to extend to be defined on all of G. Well, it turns out as a consequence of that, just a simple corollary, you get an important fact that says that every lattice, say in SLNR, actually is an arithmetic subgroup. Okay? And again, this is only if n is bigger than 3 because we need super rigidity. So what that means is basically that in SLNR, the only lattice is SLNZ. That's not quite right because there's a, a super rigid, but no, I mean, so what this thing is, all 
all through today, whenever I made a lattice, I just took the integer points of g. The arithmeticity theorem says that if you're, the only way to make a super rigid lattice is by taking integer points. So what this saying and is that the only way to make lattice is just do exactly what I did today. Just take the integer points. But actually, we'll see in maybe the th my third lecture that that's not quite all. There's some minor modifications you can make. But that's, that's fine. That's, that's not the main thing. Okay? So an important, uh, an amazing consequence of super rigidity is that every lattice in many, many groups can be obtained just by taking integer points. And again, let me just say that this is a general theorem consequence of super rigidity, so the same theorem is true for other simple groups as long as the real range is at least two. So in almost every simple group, the only way to make a lattice is just to take integer points. And what that means is that every lattice in SLNR is an arithmetic subgroup. It's a consequence of super rigidity, but I think it's not at all an obvious consequence of super rigidity. So let me go ahead and explain why this theorem is a consequence of the super rigidity theorem. I don't think that's obvious at all. It's a very interesting proof. So the main yeah, so what I do is give a proof that every lattice, let's say just an SLNR, is arithmetic. If you have a lattice, well it's got I'm assuming it'll be is super rigid. I'm going to show that in fact it has to be in your points. Okay? So that's what I want to prove. I want to explain why super rigidity implies arithmeticity. So this is the only proof I'm going to give today. So here's the deal. Let gamma be any lattice nest one Well, actually, all lattices are super rigid, though. So let's assume it's a super rigid lattice. Okay, that's the key thing. I want to show that gamma is just the integer points of SLNR. And it turns out it's enough just to show that gamma is contained in the set of integer points, because remember, it's cocum, anything that was a, if, yeah, let me not worry about that. It'll have to be, because it's going to be finite, uh, it's co-compact, it'll have to be finite index there. So let me not worry about this. Let's just get it to be contained inside. It can't be that small. So what that means is I want to show that every matrix entry of every element of gamma, gamma is an integer. So take an element of gamma. I want to show that all the entries of that matrix are integers. That's my goal. But to start with, I'm not going to be able to right away show that they're all integers. Let me first just show that they're rational numbers. So I'm not going to be rational. I'm just going to show they're algebraic numbers. Okay, let's just show that at least none of the entries are transcendental. That's all we'll do for a start. And eventually want to get to show that they're in fact integers. Okay, well, let's do a proof by contradiction. Let's suppose that some matrix entry, some gamma, so gamma is some element, little gamma is some element of the group gamma, and then gamma ij will be some matrix entry of gamma. Let's suppose that that's transcendental. It's not an algebraic number. Well, it's a general theorem of, of uh, field theory, but then there's going to be some field automorphism of the complex numbers that takes gamma ij to any, trans, any other transcendental number. Okay. So you can let gamma ij, you can map gamma ij to any, almost anything you want, lots of different things, okay, any transcendental number. And now what I'm going to do is just, so this is a map that's defined on C. Well, I can define, I can extend that to be defined, and we call it phi tilde is a map on matrices. And just first, I mean, you're supposed to look at n by n matrices. Let me just say two by two just to make it easier to see here. So just, if you apply phi to all the entries of a matrix, that'll give you the matrix. And the crucial thing is that phi is a ring automorphism, and so that means that phi tilde, well, if it's preserving addition and multiplication, then on matrices, the phi hat map is going to be a group homomorphism. So phi tilde is defined on all of gamma. It turns the elements of gamma into other matrices, and it respects group multiplication, because group multiplication is defined just by multiplying and adding matrix entries. Okay, so I've got a homomorphism from gamma into, into a group of matrices, and now I use the fact that gamma is super rigid. I've got a homomorphism from gamma into GLN, into a group of matrices. This has to extend to a map that's defined in all of G. Okay. With G is S1R here. So I can now map S1R into GLNC. But here's the thing. There are un I mean, I could, this question mark could represent any transcendental number. There's uncommonly many different transcendental numbers. And any different number you take is going to give you different fees. So there's uncommonly many different fees. That gives me uncommonly many different fee tildes. That gives me uncommonly many different fee hats. So there's uncommonly many different maps of S1 and R into matrices, but that's just plain false. It's a fact of representation theory that S L N R has only finitely many whole representations of any given dimension there. Right. So that's the contradiction. We're getting uncommonly many different maps, but actually only five of many exist. That's a contradiction. What that contradicts is an assumption that gamma is transcendental. 
Uh, so the superagility tells us immediately that all the nature countries have to be outbreak numbers. So here's where we are now. I've got a lattice in SLNR. And I now know that every matrix entry is an algebraic number. I'm trying to show the entries are integers. Well, the next step is just to show that they're rational. Okay, so that they're rational numbers. Well, it's a fact. Um, I'll talk a little more about this uh, another day. But it's a fact that gamma, any lattice, is finitely generated. So it's generated by finitely many matrices. Generated as a group by finitely many matrices. And now, if you look at, we've got finitely many matrices. Each matrix just has finitely many times. Each matrix has n squared matrix entries. So there's just some finite, if you look at all of these generators, look at all the entries that generate, you just get a finite list of numbers. We'll just take the field they generate over Q. And they generate a field extension of Q. You've got some finite number of matrices. And remember, they're all algebraic numbers. I've got finite many algebraic numbers. I put those together with the rational numbers. That'll give me a field extension of finite degree. And that's what's called that's what's called an algebraic number field. An algebraic number field is just a finite degree extension of Q. And, and the point is that, OK, so this finite extension, if I call it F, well, then Every element of gamma, if you think about it, the matrix entries, every element of gamma is a product of these matrices that I took the entries of. So every element of gamma, all of its entries are just sums and products of these matrix entries we started with. So every element of gamma is contained in SLN over this algebraic field, algebraic number field F. Okay, and F is a finite extension of the rational numbers. Well, to a number theorist, all algebraic number fields are pretty much the same. I mean, if you prove something for Q, you prove it for any number field. So let's just assume that this extension is just Q instead of being something else. And this is cheating a little bit, but it, it's really a very minor cheating, because I'll explain in the third lecture there's something called restriction of scalars that actually turns any algebraic number field into just Q. So anything you can do for, for Q, you'll be able to do for algebraic number field. And in fact, here we've got gamma in SL and F. Well, it turns out that we can put gamma inside not SL n of q, but gamma maps into s l n times d, where d is the degree of the field extension times q. So what we right now is know is that actually gamma is inside s l n of a field extension, but I mean q, q joins square root of 2, they're all pretty much the same. Let's, let me ignore that difference. Let's just pretend that gamma is inside s l n of q. Right? So that means that all the entries are rational. So here's the deal. We now know that all the red entries are rational. The last thing I want to show now, I'm going to show the matrix entries are integers. And if you've got a bunch of rational numbers and you want to show the integers, what you want to show is that they have no denominators. But the denominator is one of all these rational numbers. Okay. But actually, I'm, I'm not going to show that. I'm just going to, well, I guess I should say, I'm not getting a, I, it should be clear at this point, I'm not getting a detailed proof, but I'm getting an outline of the proof of how to do this. So the thing is, we're not actually going to show the matrices have denominator one. What we'll show is just that the denominators are bounded. Okay. They won't be one, but they're bounded. And then it's an exercise to prove that, in fact, if in all of gamma the denominators are bounded, all the denominators are less than 100, say, then in fact there's going to be a finite index subgroup of gamma that has denominator 1. Right? So in finite, the point is the denominators are within a finite distance of being 1. Well, then there's some group that's within a finite distance of gamma that has denominators 1. That's an exercise. Right? So that's it. So I'm not going to actually prove there's no denominators, but I'll prove the denominators are bounded. And the point is, actually, uh, yeah. Remember, gamma is finitely generated. So that means that if you look at the denominators of matrix entries in those generators, there's only finitely many matrix entries. Each entry can only have finitely many primes in its denominator. You're only going to get finitely many primes that can occur anywhere in the denominator. So maybe there's. Yeah, I guess the way to think about it is if you have a, yeah, if you know what primes occur in the denominators of the generators, when you start multiplying those matrices together, there can't be other primes that suddenly appear in the denominators. When you multiply or add rational numbers, if there's a prime that wasn't in the denominator of any of those numbers, it's not something that appear in the denominator of those numbers. Okay, so there's only finite many primes to worry about. What that means is, I want to show that the denominators are bounded. So I've got a bunch of numbers. I want to show they're bounded. Those numbers only have finite many primes in them. That means it's enough to show that each prime occurs to a bounded power. 
as long as the denominator bounded, but I don't have to worry about the whole number, it's just I have to worry about each prime that occurs. Right, so yeah, let me say where we are now. Right? I've got a lattice. I'm trying to show that the entries are integers. What I know is that they're all rational numbers, and all I have to show is that each particular prime only occurs to a bounded power in the denominators of those matrices, and then we'll be done. Right? So, well, it turns out I don't have to do anything. This is just another famous theorem. This is the conclusion of, I've been talking about super rigidity all along. Well, there's a super rigidity theorem for not for the real numbers or complex numbers, but for piatic numbers. It's called the non Archimedean super rigidity theorem. Margulis proved at the same time as he proved the super rigidity theorem I said before. If you have a lattice in SLNR, and you have to assume n is at least 3, If you had a homomorphism gamma into SLK of, so you have a homomorphism in the matrix group over before, I was just putting an R there or a C there. The point is, you can put any local field, you can put piatic numbers there. If you have a map into piatic matrices, then, okay, if you have any homomorphism in piatic matrices, then the image of that map Actually, well, I'd like to say that the image is trivial, but that's a little bit too strong, but it's with enough bounded distance of being trivial, it's got to have compact closure. It's pre-compact. And so the image is bounded. That's exactly what, so there aren't any maps. I mean, what should happen, yeah, let me say it this way. So super rigidity should say that if you have a map from gamma into this group, it should extend to be defined on all of G to that group. But G is connected, and this group is totally disconnected, the only map from a connected group to a totally disconnected group is going to be constant. It would have to be the trivial homomorphism. So it should be the case that the image has to be trivial, but there is some fine print involved in all this stuff I said, and so you could be off by a bound of distance. That's all. So essentially the map is trivial, but the super rigidity often has to pass by an index on group or pass to a bound of distance. So what will have to happen is that the image has not had closure. And now, if you know about the topology of piatics, what that exactly means is that there's some, I shouldn't use the same K, that was a mistake. Okay, there's some number, and we call it K, so that no matrix, I mean, I mean, a set with compact closure means that there's no P to the Ks in the denominator. That's exactly what I was trying to prove. Okay, so I want to show that each prime occurs to a bounded denominator. Well, that's exactly the same as saying that the image of the set has compact closure, piatically. And so let me just, summarize what I've just done here in this last proof here. So the way the proof of arithmetic of arithmeticity works is the ordinary super rigidity, Archimedean super rigidity, super rigidity for real matrices, for real Lie groups, proves that the matrix entries are, well, I said they were rational, but actually it just says that they're in some algebraic number field. But then once you've got them rational, you can apply the non-Archimedean, the piatic super rigidity, to see that in fact they have to be integers or within a bounded distance of the integers. And that's where I'll stop today. Tomorrow we'll talk about something completely different. But I hope you have some idea of what super rigidity is and why it might be important. That's it. Thank you.